Folks, um, this morning we awoke to the news of the passing of one of the greatest actors of all time, uh, Sidney Poitier. He passed away last night, uh, surrounded by his family at the age of 94. He was the first African American to win a uh, Best Actor for Lilies of the Field. He also, of course, starred in numerous movies uh, in the heat of the night, A Raisin in the Sun. He was uh, the measure by which many African American actors, many, many actors, period, measured themselves by. He was uh, a tall man, that amazing, booming voice, but actually it was that voice that also caused him not to become an actor uh, because when he was working with the Negro Ensemble, his Bahamian accent was so thick, he got booted out. He worked on it, came back, and of course, uh, the rest is history. Uh, uh, this is, of course, uh, it, was, it was really a sad news. I confirmed the news this morning uh, with uh, one of the foreign minister of, of the Bahamas, uh, and was uh, Foreign Minister Mitchell. And this was the announcement, uh, and we're going to show you a little bit. This was the announcement that the, prime, the current prime minister of the Bahamas made in a national address for one of their national heroes. My dear friends, it is with great sadness that I learned this morning of the passing of Sir Sidney Poitier. Our whole Bahamas grieves and extends our deepest condolences to his family. But even as we mourn, we celebrate the life of a great Bahamian, a cultural icon, an actor and film director, an entrepreneur, civil and human rights activist, and latterly a diplomat. We admire, we admire the man, not just because of his colossal achievements, but also because of who he was, his strength of character, his willingness to stand up and be counted, and the way he plotted and navigated his life's journey. The boy who moved from the tomato farm of Cat Island to become a waiter in the United States. The young man who not only taught himself to read and write, but who made the expression of words and thoughts and feelings central to his career. The man who expressed his rage against racial injustice through quiet dignity. The humanitarian who used his steely determination not just to better himself, but to better the world that he lived in, filtered through the milk of human kindness. And all of it achieved without sacrificing integrity, charm, elegance, or wit. These things don't come easily, but the fight can be good. Your peers don't give you an Oscar, you win an Oscar. Success is not a given, but it can come to those who translate talent into craft and perseverance. As the Sidney said himself in his autobiography, you don't have to become something you are not to be better than you were. This is the mark of the man. In our national anthem, we, we remind ourselves to see how the world marks the manner of our bearing. So Sydney's bearing upon the world shines as among the best of us. Our country is in mourning. And so I've instructed that the Bahamian flag be flown at half-mast at home and in our embassies around the world. We know the world mourns with us. So Sydney's light will continue to shine brightly for generations to come. All right, folks, we're joined by uh, three incredible actors in their own right. Clark Peters, he joins us live from London. We're also joined by Harry Lennox, uh, Blair Underwood. Of course, we still have Dr. Greg Carr, uh, who is still with us. Uh, Clark, uh, you are the uh, senior statesman among this group of actors, and so I'll go ahead and begin with you. Uh, share uh, with our audience your thoughts, reflections on Sidney Poitier. Um, first time you met him, uh, what was it like? Just whatever you want to, whatever you have to share. I was doing, um, well, first of all, thank you for that. And I, th I think that the Prime Minister of the, of the Bahamas uh, said what was needed to be said for all of us. Um, I had not been in the States for many years, and I was, my first job back there was in 1998, I believe, and I was doing Iceman Cometh. And at the end of 
At the end of the uh, the show, I got a call to come down to the stage. Someone wanted me to meet me. And I came down and entered stage right, and there was a woman there who said, my husband wants to, uh, would like to talk to you. So I crossed the stage, and it was dark. It was after the show, and I was looking down to make sure I didn't fall, and I saw a pair of shoes. And the shoes turned into some cuffs and legs, and I followed them up in the shadows, and there was Sidney Poitier. And I almost fainted. <laughs> I let him know that I had, um, I had read his book and wanted to talk more about uh, distribution, film distribution, as well as production and directing. And he said, well, there's no use in writing, producing, acting, directing if you don't have distribution. So that's the conversation that, uh, unfortunately, I never had with, with Sydney. But um, I know that I stand on his shoulders, as we all do. Blair, and I'm not too yeah. sure. Go, no, go ahead, go ahead, Clark, go ahead. Um, I wasn't too sure. It, it, it was silent there, and I didn't know whether I was just talking to myself. No, 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 you can no, go ahead. I'm, I, I'm giving everybody space to share. Oh, I could go on. I could go on, Roland. You know, this, you know from, from his politics you know, to his acting, you know, a, a, a man who started on the stage in Harlem and wound up on the stage of the world. You know, this is, this, this is no, uh, these are no small achievements, you know. And I thank God that I had him in my life for the moment that he was here. Mm -hmm. And I will continue to carry on the way that he has mentored all of us to be, you know, with integrity, play your truth. You're an actor, play your truth. Don't sell out, you know, tell your story. Use your craft to, to mold and change the world. Simple as that. I got that from him. Blair Underwood, you posted a photo on Twitter today of a conversation you and he had uh, on stage. I think we had that photo, so the guys have so show it. Uh, and he was certainly the gold standard. Uh, when I do interviews uh, with um, actors, uh, when they talk about uh, who do they want, who they look, who do they look up to, who they love to work with, the first name that always comes out is Sidney Poitier. Absolutely. Uh, first of all, Roland, thank you for having me tonight. Man, Harry, Clark, everybody on the Zoom, it's great to see you all. You um, too, baby. You know, and, and to celebrate Mr. Portier, you know, if you knew Mr. Portier, he was a man, I have, my, in one sense, my heart breaks, but he was a man of such joy, had such a great sense of humor, and um, would always find the, the happiness in, in, in every moment, the upliftment in every moment. But, um, but you're right, that quote you're referring to, he said to me years ago, um, he signed in his book, his, his memoir, he said, you know, I expect twice as much from you than I did from myself because you are better prepared. He said, I had an accent I had to overcome. Um, the opportunities weren't there uh, at the time. So I expect that much from you and more. So I, I carry that always. You know, I, 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 as I said, I, I hope to, to make him proud. And he was there. You know, I love hearing Clark's story. Because that's how I met him. The first time I met Mr. Portier was on a plane ride. It was my first week I was doing L.A. Law. It was in the 1980s, and things were opening up career-wise. And I had left college, and I had to write a final thesis. Uh, to, so my three years out in the world would serve as credit uh, for what I, that year and a half I missed at school. And I was going to spend that plane ride from New York to Los Angeles writing that thesis. And as God would have it, I walked you know, on the plane. I turned the corner. And like Clark said, the first thing I saw were these, these feet. <laughs> and these, these long legs, and this tall, elegant man was sleeping, and my seat was right next to Mr. Portier. Wow. Those five, that thesis ended up being this five-hour conversation with Mr. Portier, and, and he'd just been there every step of the way, every part of my career. He'd been there. I, I did a one-man show once, 99 Seat Theater, and he was there on the front row. But like, like Clark, Clark, Clark said, he mentored so many of us from afar and intimately. You know, mm -hmm. for him to take the time after his show to say, I want to see you, you know, tell his wife, I, please, I, love, I want to meet, see and meet this gentleman. Um, I am eternally, and so many of us feel this way, just grateful mm -hmm. for his, his, uh, his, his humility and selflessness. Harry Lennox, you are not a small man. You are also a uh, rather tall, big brother. Uh, and when you, when you, when you, when you, when anyone who met Sidney Poitier, I mean, when you talk about, a, people talk about stature, but he was a tall man. He towered over people. He had stature. 
presence. Well, yeah, you sir, certainly. I mean, in, in, in bucket loads of it. Uh, but what an honor to be able to, to, to talk about it. If I didn't have the, the great experiences of a personal connection, like Brother Blair and, and Brother Clark, but actually, the first time I ever saw him in person, he was somewhat older, you know, and uh, I was in awe. I sort of didn't want to get to, to uh, know him in the sense that there could be no greater impression that I would have of him, you know, like, so, it, so anything, I just remember him in every aspect of my life. Like, without Sidney Poitier, I would not be an actor. Uh, and I mm -hmm. wanted to sort of keep him in that sort of distance reverence <laughs> just because I knew that there was no higher esteem that I would ever uh, be able to hold him in. And he was always this icon that I, that I revered. Um, you know, I, I, I think about all of the, the credit that he gets for what he did off screen, but what he did on screen can never really truly be equaled. That is to say, he was the first, perhaps to this day, the only person who embodied the ethos of the time. I mean, he was the icon of the civil rights movement. He was the, uh, the, the sort of aspirations of black people in the American experiment. He didn't have to say anything other than he ever said uh, off screen uh, every, or, or off stage. Everything that he did on there was the very epitome of the hopes and dreams of the people. And so, you know, I mean, there's, there's really no way to get around him. Uh, I, I don't think he uh, is a titan. Uh, he cannot die. You know, he is an indelible part of, of, uh, of the American fabric of, of film history. There's nobody like him. There will never be another person like that. There can be no sort of reinvention of the wheel in that way or putting the toothpaste back in the tube. He did it just by uh, what he represented through his vocation. I'm going to do one more round with each one of you. We've got tons of people who we have booked on the show, but, but I want to play this. This was uh, a news conference where Sidney Poitier, at his best, chastising uh, the media for placing him in a box. Uh, Clark, I want you to respond to this after we play it. Watch this. There are many aspects to my personality that you can explore, I think, uh, very... Uh, constructively, but you sit here and ask me such one-dimensional questions about a very tiny area of our lives. You ask me questions that fall continually within the negroness of my life. You ask me questions that pertain to the narrow scope of the summer riots. I am artist, man, American, contemporary. I am an awful lot of things, so I wish you would uh, pay me the respect due and not simply ask me about those things. That was 52 seconds of brilliance, Clark. You know, the world doesn't begin and end at the Atlantic and the Pacific coast in America. The world and artists and our artistry is bigger than all of that. And not only should the flags be at half mass on that island, they should be half mass across America. And when America can rise to, can raise itself to the, to the level of integrity that Sydney is addressing here, then we might be somebody. But right now, they still need to be chastised the way that Sydney has chastised them in that interview. Blair? Uh, Blair, I think you're on mute. Sorry about that. There right, we go. Me now? There we go. Yeah. No, I'm saying that's one of my, my favorite interview responses of, of all time. Uh, one of my favorite movies is Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. Uh, Mr. Portier has that scene with his father, and he says, Dad, you see me, you see yourself as a colored man. I see myself as a man. 
his response in real life was an expansion of that moment in that movie. And so many of us as, as black actors, I know speaking for myself, I am profoundly proud of my blackness, my Negroness as it was back in the day. Um, profoundly proud of that. But I, I will be damned if I'll let somebody limit me in the roles I'm allowed to take or the roles we will create, the stories we're able to tell by just promoting me as a black man. We are men, we are human beings that are black, and that is not to be taken off the table. I, I, one of my, the, the phrases I hate the most is colorblind. I don't want you to be colorblind. I want you to see my Negroness, my blackness, but, in, but beyond that, there is our humanity. And he spoke to it so eloquently in that moment. It's as relevant today as it was then. Harry Lennox, he is, he is not limited to acting. Uh, he was a director. Uh, he was an activist um, uh, when it came to the work in the civil rights movement, but he also was a diplomat serving uh, as ambassador. Uh, and so, uh, Timmy Poitier was a renaissance man. He just did, he wasn't just in front of the camera. That's very true. I think he falls, you know, he was sort of the natural uh, predecessor, successor, I should say, of, of, uh, of the great Paul Robeson, that is more than an actor. But, you know, I think, I think uh, whatever. You know the the, uh, uh, the anger that he had in that moment at, at that particular time. He achieved what he wanted. I think that now people do see him as all of the you know what he's asking for, clamoring for really in that response. He achieved, and, and I think that that's uh, that's probably the greatest tribute that we could pay to him. It's very interesting. Brother Clark was talking about. It. He said, without distribution, you know, uh, you, you know, what's the point of doing all of these things? And I, I'm reminded of the fact that, you know, even there. He had achieved already, in some measure, those things that he is and was then instructing, instructing and mentoring us to do. He was one of the the, the he was a member of uh, United Artists, you know, for example. Uh, so he was about producing, directing, doing those things that he suggested, living the examples that he set forward, and uh, and encouraging others to do. So he did it. I don't know what else. Uh, we could have expected of an artist. Uh, I don't. I think that he paid dividends on anything that we might reasonably expect for for somebody that we admire and emulate uh, to mm -hmm. be able to do that and then some. There, as I say, uh, it's going to be. He's a hard act to follow, and I take great <laughs> solace in the fact that he got to see. All of the all of his flowers while he was alive. Indeed. Well, not, Amen. not only Amen. got to see the flowers, but he also got to see uh, the next two to three generations of black actors uh, follow in his footsteps and to be able to be on the, the big screen, the small screen, streaming, all of those services. Uh, and he did pay attention. Uh, I'm not going to do it right now, but later in the show, I've never told this story, uh, but it's a personal story. Uh, of me and Sidney Poitier from 2013. Uh, and I'm going to read exactly what he said to me. Uh, folks, uh, absolutely blew me away. Uh, and again, when you talk about his grace and dignity, when you hear uh, what I'm going to read, uh, you'll understand that. And so uh, that certainly was who he was. Clark Peters, Blair Underwood, Harry Lennox. Gentlemen, I certainly appreciate y'all joining us here on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Yes. Thank you, Roland. Thank you. Have it's a good time, night. Brother. Thanks Wonderful a lot. Being your company, brothers. Nice to share the screen with you guys. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Folks, uh, we've got a lot more, a lot of folks who are going to be joining us, uh, sharing their thoughts and reflections on uh, Sidney Poitier. Uh, when we come back, we'll talk with Clifton Davis, Glenn Turman, and also show you when President Barack Obama awarded the President Medal of Freedom to Sidney Poitier in 2009 at the White House. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered as we remember the great Sir Sidney Poitier on the Black Star Network.
What's up, y'all? I'm Will Packard. Hello, I'm Bishop T.D. J. What up, Lana Well, and you are watching Rolling Martin Unfiltered. <laughs> Folks, we reached out to a lot of people today who want to share their thoughts and reflections uh, about Sidney Poitier. Uh, many of them could not join us because they are on projects, they're traveling. Uh, but uh, social media uh, has been filled uh, with so many tributes uh, pouring in. Folks, go ahead and pull up the first one uh, that we'll share with folks. Uh, again, people have been posting on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, I mean, you name it, uh, they've been doing it. Uh, and so we want to share with you uh, some of those social media posts. You guys, let me know when we have those ready. Right now, but I want to go to actor Clifton Davis, my alpha brother. Clifton, how you doing? I am blessed and saddened, so deeply saddened by the passing of this this giant, this amazing uh, human being. To it touched my amazing. life profoundly. Uh, share with us uh, your personal recollections: um, meeting, talking with, uh, uh, acting with Sidney Poitier. Share with us. Um. Let's say, first, I was a fan. First, I was a fan. I think it was Blackboard Jungle or something like that. And, and then, of course, the other films that he made early on in his career. And uh, when Defiant Ones came out, something stirred within me. And uh, then he did a movie with Clark Gable. And, and Gable respected him. You could see it on screen. And, and he was a giant. I first met him walking down 57th Street in New York. And uh, I spotted him. I was unknown. I was a chorus boy in Hello, Dolly, uh, back in 1967. And uh, I saw him. I said, Sidney Poitier. He turned around and looked at me and said, hello, son. <laughs> and went on about his business. I mean, I was a total stranger just bumping into him on the street. Years later, of course, I met him and uh, I got, you know, my little uh, moment of fame. And, and we happened to be together at an award show in, uh, San, in uh, Oakland, California, the Black Filmmakers Awards. And uh, that's my mama was a very popular show at the time. Uh, I was backstage just humbled and in awe because I was there with Sidney Poitier and Ruby D, mm. who uh, uh, Glenn is going to talk about. He's got, good Lord, he's got really firsthand <laughs> wonderful stories. But I stepped out of the door, and there was a crowd of young ladies out there who were screaming and tearing at my clothes and trying to get me. We backed into the, back into the uh, theater, and Sidney was standing there, and with the most charm you can imagine, he looked at me with a twinkle in his eye and said, Clifton, what did you do to those young ladies? <laughs> I said, Sydney, I'm trying to do what you've been doing for 25 years. <laughs> Let me try to catch up just a little bit. <laughs> he must not laughing because he was making a joke, obviously. But uh, he was very kind and very gracious throughout that day and always humbled. He didn't walk around like, I'm the first black man to win an Oscar. He was someone who was approachable. He had so much dignity. He inspired me so much because he was black nobility and he was so tall, he was a giant. Uh, it was just wonderful to see him in person, to talk with him, to hear his his dignity, his, his humor, his honor. Um, wow, his humility. The man didn't have to be that humble, but he was. And at the same time, he was proud. Uh, it was amazing. And then down through the years, we, we bumped into each other here and there. I never had the privilege of working with him. But uh, the last time I saw him was in uh, uh, the Bahamas. And I came walking out of the Atlantis Hotel with my wife. And uh, he looked at her and he looked at me. I said, Mr. Poitier, Ambassador Poitier. He was going to a lunch meeting or something. He looked at me and he 
didn't address me, turned to my wife and said, he is a very lucky man. <laughs> <laughs> and we, were, we were, have always been lucky uh, to be able uh, to touch the greatness uh, and spend uh, just a little time with uh, Sir Sidney Portier. Clifton Davis, I know you're busy on the road with Wicked. I appreciate you stopping yeah. by and sharing with us uh, your thoughts about Sidney Portier. Thank you so much. Appreciate I'm going to miss him. Appreciate it, Frat. Thanks a lot. All right, folks, All right. Uh, in a second, we're going to be chatting with uh, actor Courtney B. Vance. But right now, I want to go to my man, the biggest cowboy in Hollywood, even though he's from New York City, Glenn Terman. <laughs> Glenn, how you doing? How you doing, baby? How you doing? I'm good, man. How you doing? I'm can, doing great. Can I can hear you. You know, one of the first things I thought about this morning when I saw the news and I called the uh, the, mm -hmm. the Minister of Foreign Affairs in the Bahamas who confirmed his passing, uh, when we talked, you were like, Sydney, Sydney. I mean, and it's like, you, when, you, if you, if, 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 when you say Sydney, there's only one person you think of. <laughs> you don't think about Sydney, Australia. You don't think about, you think of Sydney Poitier. Sydney P, he's the man, that's right. Always will be in my book, you know. I, 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 first of all, I'm so heartbroken, you know, so heartstruck in, uh, with this, this, this news, you know, because he kind of thought he'd live forever, you know, with 94 is a good run, yeah. you know, any, any way you look at it, you know, and my heart, of course, goes to the family who I've already put in a call to, but I haven't spoken with yet, you know, um, especially uh, his, his daughter, Pam. Because we grew up together from uh, as teenagers when I was doing a Raisin in the Sun at the age of 12, 13. Uh, so she and I are about the same age, and I look forward to speaking with her. But uh, she was always considered my, we considered each other play sister and brother, you know. We, we were that, that close as a result of my working with him at, on Broadway in a Raisin in the Sun, you know. And, uh, but, um, he was the kind of man that influenced me so much in all of my my career, and as well as my character building as a as a man, you know, because he caught me at a an influential age that 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 age where you go from you know boyhood to young 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 manhood, you know, young adulthood, uh, a teenager, and uh, some of the things that I remember, you know, we were on Broadway. And right down the road, uh, down the street on, on 46th Street, he was starring in the movie um, um, Porgy and Bess. And uh, the play, Raisin, was around the corner. So I could go out the back door, the stage door of the theater, the least, where, the theater that we were playing at, and uh, go to the corner and go to the, into the movie on the side door, go into the movie and watch him on screen doing Porgy and Bess, you know, and there he was, larger than life, you know, like, what, 60 feet, you know, and then I realized that I had to get on stage for my cue, and I'd run out of the theater and then run into the stage door and run on stage and run to his arms, and there he was, you know, the same guy I just saw on the, on the, uh, in the movie theater. So it was a very fascinating time to see this man larger than life and then run into his arms and have him say, and this is my son. And he is the fourth generation of our family, and we are proud. We are very proud people, you know. It was uh, uh, quite an, uh, an experience for me. It, you know, again, we, we, we see people on the big screen, and we see them mm -hmm. on television, and folks are like, oh, my God, I mean, they are these, these iconic figures. I did an interview earlier today, and we were talking about Dr. Dorothy Cotton and Reverend Dr. Mm -hmm. Martin Luther King Jr., and I mm -hmm. said uh, they were icons, but they were also just regular, ordinary people. Well, that was silly. Uh, you know Art Evans, the actor Art Evans, great actor, you know, dear friend, uh, uh, you know him from uh, Soldier's Story or um, yes. uh, Die Hard. And we used to run into Sydney at a, a park here in Los Angeles called Poinsettia Park. This was back in the day. And Poinsettia Park had a, a, a tennis court. And we thought we could play tennis. Now, Sydney could play tennis, but we thought we were better than him. 
So we challenged him individually to a game. He said, no, I won't play you. I'll play both of you at the same time. <laughs> he whooped our butts. And it was, it was great to hear him talk smack. You know, <laughs> as he was whipping us, you call that a game? <laughs> Is that the best you can do? You know, <laughs> and as he just, I whip your ass. <laughs> oh, oh, man, he beat us. I'm not talking about that to this day, you know. So, yeah, he, he could talk a lot of trash and he could back it up. Well, that's the whole point. If you're going to talk trash, you absolutely uh, back it up. Uh, Glenn, uh, share just your, your, your final thought uh, about Sidney Poitier. Well, I, I, I'm honored to have known the man. <coughs> he was, you know, so, so uh, influential in my career, the choices that I made. He was always accessible for me. You know, Sydney. Uh, uh, how do I how do I deal with this, Sydney? They're, they're doing this to me. <laughs> you know, they put up this roadblock. How do we get around that? How do I, you know, um, Sydney? I've written a play. Would you uh, would you come see it? You know, and tell me what I need to do with it. You know, and he he'd show up. He'd do it. He said he was responsible for me getting my first agent here in California, Marty Baum. You know, a man named Marty Baum who was. A, it was a giant of an agent who was, was part of an agency called uh, GAC that later became ICM, that later became CAA, you know. It was, it was, so he was just a, oh, God, I'm going to miss that man. Glenn Terman, uh, we appreciate it, man. Uh, he was indeed uh, a man of big stature, uh, and that was nothing like when you walked in his presence he had a smile that was uh, as uh, wide as Broadway. Yes, indeed. Glenn, always a pleasure, my brother. I'll see you soon, and when we, I come back to L.A., we're going horseback riding. Okay, baby. I'm ready when you are. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you so very much. Uh, folks, um, we, um, again, so many, so many thoughts and memories about Sidney Poitier in 2009, President Barack Obama. Of course, uh, recognize Sidney Poitier with the Presidential Medal of Freedom at the White House. Here is that ceremony. It's been said that Sidney Poitier does not make movies. He makes milestones. Milestones of artistic excellence. Milestones of America's progress. On screen and behind the camera in films such as The Defiant Ones, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, Uptown Saturday Night, Lilies of the Field, for which he became the first African-American to win an Academy Award for Best Actor. Poitier not only entertained, but enlightened, shifting attitudes, broadening hearts, revealing the power of the silver screen to bring us closer together. The child of a Bahamian tomato farmers, Poitier once called his driving purpose to make himself a better person. He did, and he made us all a little bit better along the way. Sydney Potier. <laughs> Ambassador and actor Sydney Potier has left an indelible mark on American culture. Rising from the tomato farms of the Bahamas, his talent led him to Broadway, Hollywood, and global acclaim. In front of black and white audiences struggling to write the nation's moral compass, Sidney Poitier brought us the common tragedy of racism, the inspiring possibility of reconciliation, and the simple joys of everyday life. Ultimately, the man would mirror the character, and both would advance the nation's dialogue on race and respect.
Joining me now, two great actors, stage and screen, Courtney B. Vance and Norm Lewis. Gentlemen, glad to see you. Looking good in that brim, Courtney. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, Courtney, I want to start, I'll start with you. Uh, just, just share just your thoughts and reflections uh, on Sidney Poitier. Well, you know, we, we, we miss him. We, it's been, he was 94. Um, I, I, you know, we, we, oftentimes we don't realize that we're, we have angels in our midst and, uh, he was that, you know, and when, when he was in his prime, uh, we, we saw him and a lot of times we thought, uh, in the midst of the black power movement, he wasn't doing enough. Um, but he was a trailblazer for the time period in 1963 when he won the uh, best Oscar for uh, um, uh, Lilies of the Field. He was the number one box office in the world, number one star, box office star in the world. And we were so proud of that. But five years later, when the Black Power Movement happened, uh, we were ready to push him aside. Um, and, but that's the way of the world. He, he is, he was who he was. He was, the, for, for the time period, he, let, he made us stand up taller. They call me Mr. Tibbs. And when he slapped that police <laughs> officer, Rod Steiger, and when the Rod Steiger slapped him, he slapped him right back. That's, that, that was a revolution. That was a revolutionary movement. That was a revolutionary event. And that cannot be taken away. You can't look at things from 2020, 2022 eyes and go, oh, yeah, he was an Uncle Tom, whatever. No, no, no. He was a trailblazer. He always was. He always will be. And we have to recognize that, that he was an angel then, and he is and always will be an angel for us. He is as tall as Nelson Mandela was, as, as Obama was, is, um, as Ossie Davis was, as MLK was. He was uh, a, a trailblazer. He was an, an icon of epic proportion. And in fact, Norm Lewis, uh, mm -hmm. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. talked about the importance of Sidney Poitier and his representation on screen to the black freedom movement. Mm -hmm. Well, for me, I just, you know, like Courtney B was saying, it was revolutionary to see him slap this white man at such as, as a young black man seeing this, because, you know, we didn't have those, uh, a lot of those images. And, uh, you know, to see him in the movies, to serve with love um, and to deliver these, these artistic uh, events with such grace and such honor, you know, he wasn't, uh, kowtowing to uh, what the the man was, and so he was definitely an inspiration. And I'm glad to, um, you know, to have actually gotten the chance to meet him. I, I I didn't know him that well, but I got to meet him a couple of times, and he hugged me and gave me his grace uh, of being an actor. He was like, "Good, you know, you're you're going to make it." And so maybe that from his touch, I have done uh, pretty well. Courtney, he often also talked about the weight that was on him. Um, having to represent literally an entire race, we can't we can't overlook that as well. No, no, and and we will never understand it. No one will ever understand what that generation of of trailblazers went through. Uh, Ossie Davis, Ruby D, um, the Negro Ensemble Company, when there was no one else to look up to. And they 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 set the path, they set the standard, and and for that, uh, they they were there was a great deal of of stress and a great deal of weight on them that we can't appreciate. And and much like MLK, when the world passed him by, uh, after uh, he came out against the Vietnam War, uh, he was as as uh, as um, uh, um, Gosh, uh, his he was right hand man, Andrew, Andrew Young. Yes, Andrew Young said he was better off dead. He was so depressed yep. about the yep. fact that the world passed him by, and and I'm sure Sidney felt the same thing. He saw the writing on the wall that he was no longer going to be the first go-to black person. There were the world shifted. Denzel of the Denzels of the world came up. There were other actors. There were more 
you know, effective spokespersons for the time period. And that's something that's just the way the world goes and works. And he understood that, stayed tall, did other things, directed Bill Cosby and he um, did, did, did some wonderful things that, uh, that, that lifted us up. Um, but, but his legacy will always be what it was. He was, quote unquote, the man. Indeed, indeed. Uh, Norm, final comment, please. I just want to say thank you to you to bring all of us as black men to honor such a great legend. Uh, we are his legacy. And so uh, thank you for, for this opportunity. Yeah, he, you will definitely be missed, uh, but we will remember him and uh, his, his books and his movies and, and everything else. So uh, we, we miss you, and uh, we love you. Indeed, and Courtney, when you were talking about uh, those movies with Bill, Bill Cosby, A Piece of the Action, Uptown Saturday Night, uh, Let's Get It On, uh, uh, I, 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 Let's Get It On, no, no, that was the song that was in it. It was three, three movies. <laughs> That's and, and, and Sydney, Sydney directed all three of those movies, and uh, when we talked before, I was joking with you, I was like, man, when are we gonna see you in the comedy? And when we, when, we, <laughs> we, when we got you on the show today, the first thing I thought about was Sydney in that comedic role in those three movies uh, with Bill Cosby. So uh, ma 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 maybe somebody would do a sequel to Upstown Saturday Night starring uh, Courtney B. Vance. <laughs> well, you know, it, you know, he taught us how to be. He taught us how to transition. He taught us how he taught us. He was continually teaching us to, to let it go, let, let, let it change, let, let me be me. And, you know, the world is shifting around me. I've got to shift with it. You've got to shift and let me be different. And uh, he, he showed us how, how to be, he showed us how to transition into silence because he, there was time for him to, to go quiet now. You know, there, there's a time for everything in life. That's what my Bible tells me. So I, I know that I'm, I'm, I was honored to have been in his presence. His wonderful, beautiful daughter, Pamela Poitier, took me into his presence in, in the house, in the big house, and I was able to sit with him and, and, and fellowship. It was, it was one of the, the seminal moments in my life. And uh, like Norm, I'm just grateful to have had a moment, a moment with him, you know, to be able to say he knew me. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, little old me from a uh, little boy from Detroit, you know, you know, hanging with the Giants. I, I'm just happy. Courtney B. Uh, Norm, gentlemen, I appreciate it. Norm, uh, I hate that I was so busy. I couldn't come see your play uh, in New York, uh, but we but we definitely going to make that thing happen. Watch Women of the Movement. Watch that. That's that's oh, it's, on, it's on Hulu. We'll be yeah. watching it. All right, yeah. gentlemen, I appreciate it. Courtney. Tell the queen I said hello. Certainly will. Love you all. Thank you, you Roland. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, before we bring up our next guest, Dr. Greg Carr, uh, the point that Courtney made there about just this, how vital Sidney Poitier was to black America during that tumultuous period of the late 1950s and the 1960s cannot be underestimated. Um, tonight has been, and it will continue to be, I'm sure, but so far it's just been nothing short of remarkable. Norm Lewis says something that's been reverberating in my head from the first moment when Clark Peters began to talk. We, we all, of course, you'll see a lot written in the white-facing press about the uh, Academy Awards evening when he and Denzel held up Oscars to each other and Holly Berry read the genealogy of black women who she followed in footsteps, a kind of black family moment inside the Academy Awards. But tonight to have this many black men and there, there are so many deep connections between them that run through Sidney Poitier. The, the Yoruba people have a word, itutu. It means coolness. There is something that ties together every one of those black men actors we've seen so far. They don't take roles where they bucking and eye rolling and yeah, yeah, yeah. they're all cool. You don't see a lot of teeth. You know, so whether it be Courtney B. Vance and his role as a lawyer on Law & Order, whether it be Norm Lewis and his work in the theater, or even in Defy Bloods, whether it be Clark Peters as Lester Freeman in The Wire, whether it be uh, Blair Underwood in an early Western power that makes us, I'm, I'm sorry, Posse in 1993, that makes us think about Sidney Poitier and Halle Belafonte and Buck and the Preacher, whether it be, and of course, one thing Blair Underwood shares with Sidney Poitier is they both play Jesus Christ. <laughs> Blair Underwood made, but people forget that there was a film called Brother John 
that Sidney Poitier made. It's one of my favorite Sidney Poitier movies, where he basically said, what if Jesus came back to the South in, in the middle of the 1970s? What would he do to judge the world? I mean, so you see, and of course, Harry Lennox. Nobody's cooler than Harry Lennox. I think about when he played Adam Clayton Powell. The, the, the power of Sidney Poitier, and, and I love the way Brother Vance framed it. During that moment, he could it could have been he could he was critiqued he was critiqued widely it's particularly among the younger folk but he was so subtle because if they had gone back even 20 years after he he's had some success in film his first movie no way out he plays a medical doctor he plays a south african in 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 in, in a film based on a novel out of south africa and then be, and plays two african characters the one we mentioned with clark uh with uh, clark gable he had been in a film with rock hudson playing an african continental african during the, during the anti-colonial movement sydney portier was very careful and deliberate about his roles and he was teaching all the way through and and, and that clip you showed where he was like yeah you know I can, you can ask me about a whole lot of other things in the wake of that Perhaps his blackest films, these are the things that I find the best. I mean, that trilogy, Uptown Saturday Night, A Piece to Action, Let's Do It Again, as you say, when Mavis State was coming in, Bucking the Preacher, Brother John. And then you see that slap, that slap, when Sidney Port, I remember something uh, Clyde Wood said, a film historian said, you know, black people don't get to slap white people on film. Mm. And so, and in fact, uh, he, he quoted Dick Gregory. He said, "You would have, the white man would have had to burn your house down, rape your wife, kill your dog, and then you might be able to look at him crazy. But when that character, in Ellicott, Endicott, slapped him, and he turned around and slapped him again, there's a line that that white man says after that that, I, frankly, me and my friends, this is this is our, our joke, right? When you see a white person who you know wants to say something crazy but knows better, we repeat the line <laughs> Endicott said right after that, which is, there was a time when I could have had you shot. <laughs> you, you can see it in people, but you ain't gonna say. And, and, and but who is that butler standing there? The black man looking at this go down. <laughs> the great Jester Harrison, which is from that generation of Canada Lee, which ties us back to Paul Robeson, which takes us back to Frederick O'Neill, as you said, told the man you can't act. And then he said, "Well, can I be a janitor and just clean up here?" Okay, you can keep having acting lessons. Frederick O'Neill named his early theater company for Ira Aldrich, who was Paul Robeson's hero. What connects all those cats together? Coolness. Sidney Poitier was a revolutionary. He was a revolutionary because he never allowed himself to portray who we are to the world out of pocket with a stereotype. And every actor you've had on so far, Roland, if we think about their roles, none of them have either. And that's a testament to him. And of course, Denzel and the rest. Now, um, not everybody on the show tonight is a brother. I've invited a lot of sisters. People have been very busy. They're acting. Sure. Uh, Debbie Allen, my fellow Jack Yates alumnus. Uh, she, of course, she choreographer, act director, actress. She a Renaissance woman herself. And of course, y'all, she had that killer speech at the Emmys when she was just uh, honored. Uh, Debbie, it's always good to see you. Thanks for joining us to share your thoughts and reflections on the great Sydney Portier. Thank you, Roland. Nice to be here and a cause of celebration and honor. Take it away. Just, just share what you want, what, what, what's on your mind. Well, what's on my mind is that, yeah, Sidney Poitier made such an incredible impact on me as a child. Uh, you have to know, growing up in the South in Texas, where there was a movie theater that was segregated and that certainly played movies with, you know, Elvis Presley and all the white stars and Tammy, all those movies. It was so great to go to the movie theater and see um, see yourself up on the screen. I never will forget seeing Porgy and Bess one Christmas. It was the biggest thing in the whole family that we all went to see Porgy and Bess and we saw Sidney Poitier, we saw Dorothy Dandridge, I saw Sammy Davis, Brock Peters. But um, Sidney Poitier became a real um, inspiration to all of us who, even as young kids, had ideas about what could be possible. He, you know, when you think about the history of film and how, you know, when you look at David Bogle's uh, Coons, Mammies, Tons, but that wonderful historic uh, book, how actors 
of uh, African origins were always playing caricature kind of stereotypes. You know, the big mammy, the uh, tragic mulatto, the coon, the big sprawling buck. And Sidney Poitier dispelled all, all of those myths, catapulted us into a whole nother generation of respect and uh, acceptance. He was, uh, for the first time, a black man who was articulate and always played scenes with great dignity. And, um, you know, all of this was so much about what was acceptable to white people. But at the end of the day, it was his talent that mm -hmm. emerged and went beyond even placing him in a place where uh, he was acceptable. So Sidney has long been the inspiration for the great actors that we know today. Denzel Washington idolized him. They had a very close relationship mm -hmm. um, throughout all this time, even when he was very, very challenged with his health. Uh, yep. And Chadwick Boseman, all of them uh, would pledge allegiance to the legacy of Sidney Poitier. Sh share with the audience um, this thing. It's very interesting. I mean, I've... I mean, I've been around musicians and actors and folks in these different fields. And when you talk about music or also entertainment, there were, there, were, there were few entertainers where entertainers were these, were like, not, I hate these word groupies, but for lack of a better word, groupies when they see them. Uh, and so Prince was one of those folks. When we talk about um, actors, like if Sidney Porty in the room, I don't care who you are and how many awards you got. You walk over, I won't necessarily kiss the ring, but you're going to bow down to say, that's the great Sidney Poitier. I mean, and, and that was something about being in his presence and watching how others reacted just being in his presence. I think that's a very fair statement. I've been in his, his presence many times. But what I noticed even more was his love of young people mm. and the willingness to take time to touch them, to be with them, to, you know, inspire them. Uh, he never was one that was resting on the laurel, laurels of his greatness. Mm -hmm. It was his humanity that spoke much louder than anything else to me. To me. Well, one of the things I was watching Stir Crazy the other day and mm. about a month ago, and I'm sitting there and I didn't even realize that he directed Stir Crazy. And then I immediately <laughs> went to IMDb and I was like, wait a minute, he directed this and this and this. Uh, you know, same for you, trying, you know, going not just be somebody, you know, who's acting, but also directing and producing. That was all, I, I just literally never, it never occurred to me that Sidney was also directing. Well, he was a, a man of many means and such great talent, which is so, uh, it'll be a time right now where people will start. I just taught my middle school class and I changed the whole um, curriculum today to be all about Sidney Poitier, the legacy of black people in film mm. and why young people need to not just see everything as what it is in the moment, but look back as to how did this happen where it is right now, and where might it go? Because they are the future. So we spent the day today, and I'm talking about 10 and 11 year olds mm. who don't know who Sidney Poitier is. So we spent the whole afternoon. I played excerpts of To Serve With Love, which I thought would relate to them. I, I played excerpts of Porgy and Best. Um, all of these things. Um, you know, this is going to be a time for us to mm -hmm. educate a lot of young people, um, not just what we remember, but also teach them the history and how do we get to a Denzel Washington? How do we get, That's right. you know, to the next Chadwick Boseman or to the Michael B. Jordans of the world? How, you know, mm -hmm. where, where, do, where, do, where is their inspiration? Indeed. 
Debbie Allen, always good to see you. Always good to chat with you. Please tell your sister, uh, fellow JY grad, uh, Felicia, hello. And also my man, Norm, tell him what's up as well. I will, and thank you for this conversation. It's very, very meaningful and valuable. Debbie, thanks a lot. Take care. Okay, bye. Folks, Sidney Poitier was not just an actor, director, humanitarian. He also was a diplomat. Uh, he, he served as ambassador to Japan for the Bahamas. So joining us right now is someone who knew him quite well, and that is the former prime minister of the Bahamas, Perry Christie. Uh, Doc, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing fine, Roland, and I can tell you that as a result of listening to your program, I am now very, very pleased that we gave Sidney Poitier as a gift to the United States of America and to the world. <laughs> Everything said today demonstrates how wonderful his impact has been. A great source of inspiration, not just to the United States, but to countries like ours. And particularly, when I think back of him, that if you look at the 50s, when he did the film No Way Out, acting as a doctor, faced with bigotry, describing by his performance the ugliness of bigotry, and demonstrating a very, very 21st century way of dealing with it, and allowing us to know the level of dignified presence he had. So I'm so happy, my friend, to be able to pay tribute to Sir Sidney Poitier, because he was a Bahamian who was an exemplar, an exemplar for the world. And the final point I'd want to make about him is that to all persons who have some question as to what they could become, they despair because they've had little education. Sidney Poitier's human experience must stand as one of the greatest sources of inspiration to all who would wish to achieve something for themselves, starting with very humble circumstances and an island in the Bahamas, working at a time where he had to teach himself, work in menial jobs. It is unimaginable that he could have dreamt of becoming an actor for all it took. Yet he did it, he achieved it, and he achieved a level of magnificence. So this, to me, is the greatest asset for all of us that we should preserve. Someone whose journey is so enriching, so powerful in his reach, and so meaningful in the way that he was able to do it, notwithstanding inhospitable conditions, racial bigotry that he had to overcome, and to do it with dignity, using his, charis his, his charisma, and most certainly that character that shone through. And I can tell you, sitting at his home, surrounded by books in Los Angeles, and I said to myself, here is a man who had to teach himself to read, and he's now become an author. Here is a man who, when he speaks, you almost feel like eating his words. He speaks so properly, so firmly, so clearly. And I'm just trying to emulate um, when he sat in my office and we spoke, how, how extraordinary his impact was. And, and as has been said, he walks into a room and his presence is magic. I, we owe so much to him, not just in the United States of America, not just in the Bahamas, but the world. In fact, uh, a Bahamian uh, television network uh, ran this package from a few years ago. Uh, you and others were on your way returning from China. Y'all stopped at a long layover in Los Angeles. Uh, and uh, y'all went to the home of uh, Sidney Poitier. Uh, he had a few words to share. I want to I wanna show a bit of that. We'll come back and I got a couple more questions with you. Y'all go ahead uh, and um, fire that piece uh, from the Bahamas when uh, on the visit to Sidney Poitier's home. Bahamas to the next level through providing opportunities for the disadvantaged. The winner is Sidney Poitier. It is a long journey to this moment. I am naturally indebted to countless numbers of people. And just like that, Sidney Poitier became the most decorated black actor on the international screen, etching himself into the history books of film and television. 
Later in his career, he would shed light on the Bahamas as a place he called home and where he grew up on Quainquette Island with his Bahamian parents. He was no stranger in achieving greatness. Some suggest the indomitable spirit that led black Bahamians to realize majority rule was the same spirit that led Sir Sidney to overcome surmounting hurdles to earn his spot on the big screen as he refused to be denied. And while many argue where he actually got his start in the era, one thing is undeniable. The break he received while carrying out a mediocre task in the U.S. proved that his undeniable talent and love for the cameras could no longer be ignored. Hey. Call me Mr. Tibbs. The Bahamas continues to celebrate Sir Sidney Poitier's legacy, hailing him as a hero and example for Bahamians to follow. It was no surprise that during a layover visit in Los Angeles, while traveling back from China, the Prime Minister and his delegation visited Sir Sidney at his Beverly Hills home. It's a visit one can remember for a lifetime. And though he's aging and experiencing challenges with his health, Sir Sidney's voice remains uninterrupted, sustaining the same sound and the same wit that made him famous. Sir Sidney Poitier, despite his many world-class accomplishments, still has an insatiable desire to impart his knowledge to the young generation of Bahamians. What I say back to them is what I dream of saying back to them, that I would love to always spend the rest of my life in their presence. So Sidney's advice to Bahamians is simple but profound, indicative of his undying love for country. All I could say to them is wherever they go, whatever they do, they must remember that they come from one of the greatest countries in the world. And while he's done sharing his on-screen gifts with the world, he's certainly relying on the next generation of pointers to fulfill that legacy. I have, I have 12 children, all girls. And that means I'll be spanking a lot of bottoms if they don't do as well as I expect them to do. Expressing his appreciation to have the high-level delegation visit him during the lengthy layover in Los Angeles from China, Sir Sidney welcomed the group to return in his usual witty fashion. I thank you all as friends and fellow human beings and fellow Bahamians. And I'll be pissed if you all don't come back. <laughs> Clint Watson, ZNS Network News. <laughs> Quite funny there, uh, Prime Minister Christie. Uh, he was, uh, again, someone who people thought serious in terms of how he carried himself, but uh, he uh, had a wicked sense of humor. Absolutely. And, you know, again, to think that he came from the Bahamas, to see the extent to which the world has acclaimed him enables us to say to young Bahamians, and for that matter, people all over the world, particularly in our region, that anything is possible. And I keep on saying that when President Barack Obama coined, yes, we can, Bahamians had been living that out for generations. It took an indomitable spirit to be vested in Sidney Poitier, he believed that he could do it. He invested in that belief, and he did it. Yes, we can. So long before President Obama came into being, people like Sidney Poitier and thousands of others throughout the world and region believe in themselves, and they have a source of inspiration in Sidney Poitier to emulate. And I think when we look at memorializing him, we ought to ensure that are teaching institutions that will have a culture of perpetuation in perpetuity, being able to keep the memory and the meaning of one's life, particularly when it had such a powerful impact in perpetuity for future generations to learn and learn from. And so for me, it was a pleasure when the Bahamas named him ambassador to Japan, we knew that he was going to represent us magnificently. And we had an additional pleasure of naming a prestigious bridge leading to one of our leading resorts in Paradise Island, the Atlantis, naming the bridge after Sir Sydney. And like our prime minister said in his broadcast today, that the government will be giving consideration to further research on the best way to memorialize 
and to ensure that future generations, not only of our country, but of the world, come to understand that the journey of Sidney Poitier, or Sir Sidney Poitier, was one in which that could be emulated and shared by millions of people worldwide. He gave us a sense of pride. And Roland, I went to see, as a st law student in London, I went to see guess who's coming to dinner. And I left that movie theater feeling inspired, feeling a sense of satisfaction that I had seen a man who never compromised on his blackness, who was prepared to demonstrate a level of dignity in the face of severe questioning, who understood who he was and was able to communicate that in the film. And so his magnificence as an actor was only reflecting what we have come to know were his personal values and what his personal beliefs. Sidney, much to his credit, was able to take his personal beliefs and have them enshrined in all of the diverse parts that he played in the movies. One final point. I honestly believe when we look at what happened in the Bahamas, where we had a march to majority rule in 1967, up to that point, we had a minority government running our country. Sidney Poitier was here to inspire the new government, to inspire them in their campaign, and to celebrate with them when, for the first time in 1967, January 10th, 1967, when a majority rule government was formed in the Bahamas. That helped us on the road to independence, because he also believed that we had to demonstrate as a country that we were capable of ruling our own affairs. And so the, the civil rights movement in the United States was a, was a source of, of reminder to us of what we should avoid, what we should not let happen in our country. And I can only say that the movies that Sidney Poitier did helped to shape and strengthen the level of consciousness on the part of, of the Americans towards enabling them to understand in increasing numbers the rightness of the cause of Dr. Martin Luther King and all the others, and all the other messengers who came behind extolling the virtues of equality before the law and equality in the United States of America. And that happened to be a voice and a message that the world must see, understand, and continue to work on and continue to enhance. Perry Christie, former prime minister of the Bahamas, always a pleasure to see you and chat with you. And I can't... Well, you it. must come back to the Bahamas. I mustn't let you go without saying it's better in the Bahamas. And we need you back here. Every time we talk, you you will sail the Bahamas to come back. Uh, Sigma Pi Phi Fraternity de Boule actually has their uh, national convention in the Bahamas. It was supposed to be there uh, last year with COVID, but it's going to be there. So I will actually be in the Bahamas in July, but I'm going to try to get there before July. Well, I'll see you then. And, and I can't, let, can't get, let, let you go. I always tell people, never just go to the public figure. Always uh, say hello and greet the wife or the husband. And so every time I try to need to get to you, I call Bernadette. So you please tell your gorgeous wife I say hello and thanks a lot. She, she's listening to you, and you know, you are one of her favorite personalities. Well, I appreciate it. Look forward to seeing both of y'all soon in the Bahamas. Excellent. Thank you so very much. Greg Carr, I, I don't think people here really understand what it means to, to have Sidney Poitier as a national treasure of a country like the Bahamas. No, I mean, no. I mean, how could we? How could we? we we're born in a country where we are minority. And, you know, something very interesting, Roland, listening to you talk to the former prime minister and how you opened this evening with the current prime minister, Brother Davis, and the, uh, and the, uh, the, the deputy prime minister behind him. It, those brothers are cool. The women and men of the Caribbean, you know, the Bahamas, like Barbados, like uh, Jamaica, like there's a certain, 
I don't want to call it dignity. Dignity is the wrong word. There's a certain coolness, to use that Yerba word again, that kind of emanates out of the, the, the ethos of black culture. But, but in majority black countries, you certainly see that, I think, almost as a structural a element of their structural identity. So even though Sidney Poitier was born in Miami, because his family was going back and forth between the Bahamas and Miami, selling their produce, tomatoes primarily, um, he was very much a son of that island. He was a son of that country. He was a son of that 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 nation, and it came through. So so even now, as we again we'll read in the, these other media sources, he had to you know lose his accent. He never really lost his accent, but because you hear it when you hear you hear the prime minister. In other words, he shaped it to its purpose, and so I think. It, it is it is kind of difficult for us because we will tend to read Sidney Poitier through a lens that is an American lens. Right, right. And, and that's and that and that's a problem. Let me give you one quick example. People will talk a lot about to serve with love, of course. You know, I mean, in Petunia Clark's song and Edmund Braithwaite's novel that was made into a movie. But, and I thought about Cheryl Lee Ralph. As well, you know, I know you're friends with them, so who played a, a teenager in a piece of the action where Sidney Poitier and Bill Cosby were teaching these young people in this community center. And I think that is much more, that's closer to how I think black people should be thinking about even Sidney Poitier's work when he had the clout, when he had the power, when he had the platform, he was literally helping us think about culture in a very, kind of deep way, and I think a great deal of that, to the point that you're raising, really comes from the nation of his uh, of his origin, even if not his literal birth, certainly his origin. He was Bahamian through and through. Absolutely. Folks, we're going to go to a break. Uh, here is some of the American Film Institute tribute uh, to the great Sidney Poitier. And on the flip side, uh, we'll talk uh, with more folks. Dondre Whitfield, we'll talk with uh, actor Isaiah Whitlock, uh, and many others as we continue to pay tri tribute to the life and legacy of Sir Sidney Poitier, who passed away last night at the age of 94. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered right here on the Black Star Network. How possible was it then, in 1967, to make a film like that in America? It was close to impossible, primarily because the industry was not ready for such a film, you know? So it took a guy, Stanley Kramer, who said, I would like to make a film like this, not because it's going to be sensational, not because it's going to be provocative, but because I'm a filmmaker in America, and this is a part of America. It is a part of America. And if I use this format, I could speak to the humanity in people. So he sent me a script. I read it, and I thought it was a wonderful idea, terrific idea for the time scene with my dad, who had difficulties with what was about to happen. <laughs> it was interesting for me because I have a dad, you know, a guy that I loved a great deal. And I had to use him as my emotional reference when I was speaking to my Movie Dad, played by Roy Glenn, fine actor. <sighs> it wasn't easy, but it was a scene that had to be played. So I played it as best I could and uh, worked out okay.
ain't just about hurting black folk. Right. You got to deal with it. It's injustice. It's wrong. I do feel like in this generation, we've got to do more around being intentional and resolving conflict. You and I have always agreed. Yeah. But we agree on the big piece. Yeah. Our conflict is not about destruction. Conflict's going to happen. Um, a shot of Black Lives Matter Plaza here in the nation's capital uh, where our new studios are located. Sidney Poitier was very much beyond an actor. He also was someone who was extremely involved, Greg Carr, in uh, the black freedom movement. When I interviewed Harry Belafonte for the first time, uh, this is what he, uh, folks, let me know when we have that ready. Uh, he shared with me uh, the, the role that, uh, that, that he and Sidney played. He told a story of them traveling down to the South uh, to deliver uh, about 50 or 100 thousand dollars to free workers, Greg, in um, uh, in Mississippi, and uh, they landed. Uh, they were shooting at their plane and their cars as they uh, as they uh, as they were t were driving off. Uh, it was a high speed chase, and they're in the back seat tossing back and forth. And when 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 they arrived there, Sydney Sydney said he said, "Man, he said I will never come with you again to anything like this." But Greg, when they walked into that room. And they saw all those young folks who were there registering black folks to vote, standing up to Jim Crow. Uh, Sidney remarked, and Mr. Mr. B talked about this in his documentary, in his documentary, but also in his book. He said, uh, this is one of the great things uh, of my life. He was very, very uh, uh, involved in raising money uh, for the movement. Absolutely. Yes, yes, he was. I mean, you know, I was thinking about you this morning, Roland, when we got the news, it occurred that while you were talking to Mr. B yesterday, that this this moment of transition was taking place. And you talk about cats that have been lifelong friends. I mean, as you said, when Frederick O'Neill was like, dude, you really don't belong as an actor. You need to leave. And Portier talked him into letting him stick around at the American Negro Theater to, to be, you know, to clean up in exchange for act, uh, acting lessons. He made a friendship with Harry Belafonte. And, of course, Belafonte, uh, who had family responsibilities, of course, young family at the time, didn't always make practices. And it was a practice that Belafonte missed that Portier got his break because he was was Belafonte's understudy all the time. So that led to Anna Lucasta. He got to go on the road, and the rest was history. But I, but I raised that because they were, they, were, they were more than buddies. They were brothers. And so when you're riding with your brother like that through Mississippi, and everybody knows now, at least people should know, of course, the role Harry Belafonte played, they raised money. So while folk are going to the box office and applauding Harry Belafonte and going to the movies, they are raising money. They are putting in their own money. When uh, Malcolm X was was killed, was assassinated, you know, Portier, Ruby D, Ozzie Davis, Harry Belafonte put money together to make sure Betty Shabazz and the girls had a place to stay. I mean, he didn't have to wear a sign. The people who knew, knew. And his activism is a book called Stars for Freedom that talks about the 1963 March on Washington. And of course, we just heard the prime minister talk about a critical moment in the post-colonial history of the Caribbean where Sidney uh, Poitier weighs in. Well, he's doing the same thing in the United States of America. Martin, for Martin Luther King, for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, for these orders, for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, to be able to rely on a Sidney Poitier 
means more than any of us can ever know. And all we have to do, as you have done over the course of, uh, of your career, is talk to the people who lived it. If you want to know the contribution Sidney Poitier made to the Black Power Movement, the Civil Rights Movement, you don't look for that in the books for people looking through archives. You go to ask the people who were putting their lives on the line what it meant to get money, to get contacts, to get protection, for him to say a word in a space. Sidney Poitier, yeah, it's hard to, it's hard to even, even describe the role that Sidney Poitier played in that movement. Uh, in fact, to understand how close those two are, uh, Sidney Poitier would have been 95 years old on February 20th of this year. Uh, Harry Belafonte's birthday is nine days later, March 1st, uh, when he will be 95 years old. Uh, this is uh, the, the clip, some of uh, what uh, Harry Belafonte had to say in my interview with him several years ago that we aired on TV One. Book you also offered some advice to artists. And you talked about their responsibility and how they have the voice, the platform, to address these social, cultural issues. Assess this generation of artists, black or white, and are they as involved as you would want them to be on some of the critical issues facing this country and this world? From my perspective, by no stretch of the imagination can I say that the cultural community, the arts community, is anywhere near the, the, a commitment to doing things about changing the pain that exists in a lot of different levels socially. My mentor, Paul Robeson, once said to me that it was a great adventure that I and others were embarking on. So when I was quite young, uh, Ozzie Davis and Ruby Dee and Sidney Poitier were all listening to our mentor speak when he came to see a play that we were doing. And he said, you know, artists are the gatekeepers of the truth, are the gatekeepers of truth. And it is through you that people are going to be instructed about not only where they came from, but where we should be going. And I think if you look at great art, if you look at art that is in the service of social need, you'll find that the greatness of literature, the greatness of fine, the fine arts, painting, all of those things came from men and women of consciousness who tried to better the plight of human beings. Uh, in that context, I've often looked upon the power that we have in what comes out of celebrity. Uh, when I first went to Japan, to sing, and I found myself before 50,000 Japanese trying to sing the banana boat song. <laughs> I really, I really understood power. I said, my God, here I am in a strange place with a bunch of people that I didn't know anything about except adversarially because of the war. And I said, here they were singing my song. Mm -hmm. And what do you do with this platform besides harvest money? How do you use this platform to impart a sense of our common humanity. And I think art that does that has been art that serves us well. And in my generation, we had a large number of people who stepped to the plate, whether it was Bob Dylan and Joan Baez, or it was Richie Havens, or, or it was uh, uh, Josh White, or it was Lead Belly. I mean, a litany of people. Sidney Poitier, all the actors of the period that did what they did. It's always about moving the human family ahead. And I think that artists have that power and they have the obligation to sending out information and to giving ideas and thoughts to people that will help enrich them and get them out of the quagmire in which we find ourselves. If we draw a line. Um, as one would expect, um Mr. B. Harry Belafonte is certainly taking the passing of his comrade in arms uh, very hard. I did reach out uh, to him and his family uh, and offer an opportunity for him uh, to join us uh, on tonight's show to share his thoughts. Uh, and of course, we'll, um, whenever he's ready to talk, if he wants to talk, uh, he certainly have an opportunity uh, to come on the show anytime to do so.
Uh, and so certainly our thoughts and prayers are not only with the Sidney Portier family, but all of the folks who were extremely close to him uh, over the years. Joining us right now is actor Dondre Whitfield. Uh, joins us from Los Angeles. Dondre, glad to have you on the show. Uh, th this, is, this is not an easy day for Hollywood, but definitely for black Hollywood. Bro, good to, to uh, be with you, but uh, really um, saddened uh, why, we're, why we're getting together. I, I'm very emotional um, because Brother Sidney was, you know, we're fathered by so many different men in our lives as men to get us to, to come to the kind of, of manhood that we're required to, to, to come to. And so it's not just your biological father that fathers you. There are a, a myriad of, of, of men that should come into your life to play an important role to matriculate you into manhood. And while I didn't have a personal relationship with Brother Sidney, he fathered me in some great ways. What he taught me was that I could not only have great activism in my life outside of my home, but I could have activism in my work as well. And what we heard from um, uh, Brother Belafonte talking about uh, how artists are the, the, the truth keepers, uh, we absolutely are that. And I am saddened that we seem to be lacking enough of uh, artists, men in particular, and this is no uh, disrespect to any of my sisters, but right now I really have to speak to the kind of men that we're talking about right now in this particular uh, cloth, where we seem to be lacking those that walk uh, with that same spirit, that walk with that same intention. Um, and I'm also angered by the fact that we have all of this power, all this collective power, but we seem to be influencing a, a generation to, as Brother Belafonte said, harvest riches, harvest money. What else do you do with that platform? And so for me, Brother Sidney was one of those that served as an example that not only was it okay for me to do something with that platform, but in fact, I had a responsibility to do so. Uh, as you were talking, um, I thought about uh, Jamie Foxx telling the story uh, after he portrayed um, uh, Ray Charles, and he was winning everything, and he was, uh, and then of course he goes on to win the Oscar. I mean, and he is living it up. He is partying. He is, I mean, he is going buck wild. And Oprah Winfrey and Sidney Poitier go and sit down with him and explain to him the responsibility that he now has. And he said it completely altered his perspective. That's the, also the kind of, as you say, fathering, if you will, that Sidney Poitier uh, made sure to do. Yeah, uh, it's, it's so, I mean, I'm honestly having a tough time breathing because in this moment, in losing such a, a, a pioneer, such a, a, a stalwart in, 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 in Brother Sidney, it, it, it makes me, look, he played some great characters on the screen. But in this time, we should be focusing on the great character that he had off the screen. And it, I, I struggle to think of brothers like that that are even my, my own peers. I, I struggle to think of, of, of many. Uh, there are a handful that I look to, you know, and even in this industry, I mean, of course, you being one of them, and we often have these kinds of conversations, but it saddens me that I don't have or that we don't have a bigger stable of, uh, of men that feel like this is their responsibility. 
I feel like we're having the kinds of conversation about how to, to you know, uh, how to how to get at the bag. And and I hate those kinds of conversations because what it seems to suggest is is that our lives are really about how we garner more in order to, to get clothes and shoes and and jewelry and cars and 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 you know and make these live posts on Instagram about how we're living it up as opposed to how we impact the lives. Uh, Brother Sidney had no idea that he was impacting me, but he was. And that's why every single day when I walk through this life, I know that I have to walk in a very specific way because I know that I'm impacting someone's life. I have no idea who that is. I just know that that is what it is. And so I have that responsibility. And so given this platform, I know that my maker intended me to do something very specific with that. And, and you know, I, I've, I've been asked on occasion, what's the greatest role that you've ever played in your life? And I always say the role that I play as a man, because uh, I, not throwing shade at, at anyone, and we don't have to name any specific names. I'm sure that we can come up with quite a few, but there are example after example of brothers who have not walked in a very specific way and it has tainted and tarnished things that they've done in their career, even their great works of philanthropy based on the things or the missteps that they have taken in, in walking this life out as a man. And so our activism has, has to be not only off screen, but on screen. And those are some of the greatest lessons that I took from Brother Sidney's life. And I'm so glad that you, you know, you intertwined both Brother Harry and Brother Sidney, you know, because they are great examples that I look to every single day about how I better walk my life out every single day. Don J. Whitfield, I appreciate it, brother. Thanks for joining us on Roland Martin Unfiltered to honor Sidney Poitier. Love you, brother Ro. I appreciate you. Appreciate it as well. Thanks a lot, my brother. Say hello to the wife, Sally, and to uh, that golfing son of yours. Yes, sir. All we'll right, do. then. Folks, uh, Tim Reed, comedian, actor, director, producer, studio owner. He's done it all. He joins us right now, uh, right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Tim, always good to see you, my fellow Alpha brother. Yes, brother, how are you? I'm doing great. Just uh, share your thoughts and reflections about Sidney Poitier. Well, we, we lost a giant, and we gained an, um, an ancestor. Um, uh, I loved him. Uh, the first time I ever had an opportunity to be in a film, even very briefly, was Uptown Saturday Night, and he cast me in a very small part, the opening of the credits. But just the short time I was with him, and over the years since I've had the pleasure of seeing him or having a chance to talk to him, I always walked away with a sense of, of this is what it's like. This is the grandeur of, you know, he has gravitas. This is the kind of person that I want to pattern as much of my life as I possibly can as a, as a man, not just as an actor. Um, he and Harry and those kinds of people. You know, for a little colored kid uh, raised in segregation and dreaming upon dreams, seeing these people on television, and then having the pleasure to sit next to them and talk and meet them has been one of the greatest uh, blessings that I've had in my life. The, you mentioned um, that comedic role of his that he also directed in, uh, and, and that's what I, I also uh, just loved about him. Again, you, you watch people talk about the serious roles, uh, but when you look at those movies, uh, him and Bill Cosby together uh, were absolutely hilarious. In fact, I, I, do, I do want to um, read this. Let me know if you guys have uh, the graphic. Uh, this was the statement uh, that was sent to us um, from the publicist of uh, Bill uh, Cosby. He said he was honored by AFI and along with many stars of stage and screen politics and higher education who came out to speak. I brought with me the paperback of his autobiography and I said of all groundbreaking movies that Sidney starred in, this book is the real story of this man and his journey. I am honored to have been close enough to him and work 
on serious matters. The two of them in those trilogy of films, uh, two of them obviously extremely funny. One, funny and funny and, and, and serious. Uh, but we got to see the comedic aspect of Sidney Poitier. Yeah, he had a great sense of humor. I mean, uh, you know, we, we always see him and think of him in these serious roles. But person to person, um, you know, he, he had a great sense of humor and he was fun to be with. And uh, in just general conversation, you know, he had always had this smile that uh, sort of just, you know, relaxed you and made you feel that you could you could actually be yourself and, and it would be uh, back and forth. It was it was that part of him. But he had a great sense of humor. Uh, he certainly did. Uh, Tim, uh, I appreciate you joining us, sharing a few words with us about uh, Sidney Poitier. Be sure to tell your lovely wife, Daphne, I said hello. Will do, and thank you, Ro. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Folks, uh, young actor, many say, is uh, following the footsteps of Sidney Poitier. Uh, is Sterling K. Brown. He joins us on the phone right now. Sterling, uh, thanks, for, thanks for coming on. Roland Martin Unfiltered to talk about uh, Sidney Poitier. Mr. Martin, thank you so very much to, for having me. It is an honor and a pleasure to be here to discuss this great man. Uh, what, what does Sidney, Sidney Poitier mean uh, to you? Uh, class personified, uh, uh, someone who not only showed you how to conduct yourself in front of the camera uh, or on set, but also someone to show you how to conduct yourself in this business, how to sort of uh, make sure that you were trying to put your best foot forward in making sure that the people that you represented, be that your family, your community, uh, your race, felt good about what they were seeing when they saw you and the work that you did. The one, I asked Debbie Allen uh, this 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 question. I mean, when you when people were in the room and he walked in, yeah. the room shifted. Yes, it yeah, changed. Absolutely, it changed. he. There, there's a presence, there is a, a respect for someone who was the first of so many things. Um, you know, it's funny because people will talk, talk to me about, you know, the first person to, to win a SAG award in this category or, or Golden Globe, but I'm like, nah, I'm just, I stand on the shoulders of giants in a time in which the industry really only permitted a couple of people. There was, there was Sydney, there was uh, Mr. Belafonte, um, but, like, there wasn't a lot of folks who we could look to for representation. And the fact that he was in those rooms, that he had respect in those rooms, uh, that so many people would say, like, you know, well, we don't open movies across seas or whatever, but he could do to serve with love. Like, he was the exception. Like, he was exceptional. So it was, it is right that when he walks into a room, people take notice. They stand still and they give their respect. First time you met him, what do you recall? I've never, I never got a chance to meet him. I have been mm. in his presence. So let, let me say, I was too nervous. I didn't have Are you someone serious? formally introduced. I am so serious. Nah, bro. That nah, is probably nah, the, nah. Let me tell, <laughs> let me tell, let me tell you something, Sterling. I tell everybody, ain't no yeah. guarantee you ever gonna be in a room again. Man, That's the truth. my whole deal, this is a true story, 2012, um, yeah. they, um, uh, we find out that Harry Belafonte and Sidney Poitier are going to present an award at the NAACP Image Awards. Guys, uh, that's, okay. that's photo one. Pull it up, please. And so ben, I called Ben Jealous, who was then the CEO of the NAACP. Yep. He tells me it's true. I then called Mr. B. I said, yo, I ain't never met Sidney Poitier. <laughs> I want to meet him. So when they walk out on stage, everybody stands up. Everybody stands up. Uh, and that's the photo right there, 2012. Everybody stands up and they're cheering. Yes. I get up from my seat and I go backstage because I don't know how long he's going to be there after the award. So Sterling, I go backstage and I'm waiting. And so yeah. I walk up and Harry goes, Sydney, Roland Martin. And I said, uh, Mr. Porter, good to meet you. He goes, no, we've met before. <laughs> when? When? And I look at him, I'm like, no, we have not. He said, <laughs> he says, oh, yes, we have. You and I have met through television. And he, and he then, he then goes on 
uh, to talk about, uh, and, he's, and he's talking about how much he enjoys my work. Now, I'm like, man, yes. I'm talking about your work. Okay, I'm now about to share with you a story I have never told publicly. The Let's do it, come year, on. The next year, <laughs> the next year, at the NAACP Image Awards, they honor Harry Belafonte. Okay. So, I go back, you know, I'm sitting on the front row. I got, I'll take, y'all roll the photos. This photos too. I'm taking photos and so there's a photo of the two of them on stage. I shot that photo, I'm on the floor. So when it was over, I didn't go backstage. No, guys, that's 2012. The next batch of photos. It's two, no, that's that, oh, right there. Okay, hold that photo right there. So I go backstage. So he was, he was, more, he was more frail a year later, Sterling. Sure. So, yeah, we're walking, so we're walking out, and Mr. B got his cane. He's in front of me, and Mr. Porte is to my left, and he and I are talking, and then all of a sudden, he stumbles. And I, mm. and I catch him. I catch him. Mm. And so my left hand is in the middle of his back, and my right hand is holding his right arm, and I'm, yeah. and I'm holding him up, and I'm walking him backstage, and then I'm, we walk into his car, and I, I hand him over to his assistant. This is February 1st, 2013. So two weeks wow. later, Sterling, two weeks later, yes, sir. I, I'm in Houston, I, my phone rings, TV one, rolling. Sidney Portier's office is trying to reach you. And I was like, well, give him my number. And so like five <laughs> and six people are calling me, they're calling me and I'm like, yo, what's the deal? I said, give me his number. So he, I give him my number. And Sterling, this is what happens. He answers the phone. He says, uh, he, he thanks that, he said, uh, thank you for calling. And then this is what, he begins to talk. And he says, yeah. you were really effective. Cause, so, now I don't know why he's calling me. So I'm a reporter, so I got my computer. And so <laughs> I'm just sort of like typing. He goes, you really were effective. My situation that night, I have this heart thing. I get them from time to time. As a, mat um. as a matter of fact, I'm quite close to doing something about it, which has to do with surgery. I did try to reach you to let you know how deeply appreciative I was and still am from what you did on that evening. But this is where he made me cry, Sterling. Give it to me. He says, and uh, I'm, trying, I'm trying to hold it back now. This is what Sidney Poitier says to me. This is February 15th. February, this is February 15th, 2013. Okay. He says, I watch you constantly on the show that you work on. And I find your point of view on issues that are very immediate in the lives of all Americans. And you're quick of mind and you are a very, very, very reliable person. Your, in mm. your intellectual disposition is many layered and you do a great job. You handle wow. the words, the alphabetic word, you handle them with great aplomb and you express things clearly and you've got more than your share of guts. I just have an appreciation of how you conduct life. And he ends it by saying, but you do it with such grace and you're not a backer upper. Bruh, the only, I'm gonna tell you right now, the only reason I was just not streaming tears is because I've been trained to go into reporter mode where you remove emotions <laughs> and you just sort of just work as a reporter. Bro. Yes, sir. That's and so, beautiful. Had that's I amazing. Not, had I not said, no, I'm going to meet him. That's why, man, I tell Can everybody, I tell hey, if they in the room, I'm going to meet them. The lesson has been learned. I consider the lesson learned. You schooled Brother Brown <laughs> on this evening. I thought I was calling to speak about Brother Portier, but Brother Martin had <laughs> something to say to Brother Brown, and it has been received. Thank you. Man. That's a beautiful, beautiful story. Now, I had never shared that publicly. I didn't want to share any of his health issues. Um, yeah. And, 
And I'm telling you, man, I was just, I, I was blown. I, it, he was just calling to thank me for catching him. And he shared that. Mm. And, and Sterling, I, I, I can't even just, brother, I just, you know, and he, that's how he was. And so if y'all show the photo, the last time I saw him from the Oprah event, it's when she had the Legends Ball, uh, Selma came out, this was uh, December 2014, and this photo we're showing right yes. now is at the house. And so when uh, they had a, it was a brunch, and I saw him, and again, he's this tall, big man, and he sees me, and he just throws his arms out, and then just hugs me, and it just smiles on his face, and then we took this selfie right here, and man, it was just, <laughs> it was just, man, amazing, just, man, just to be in that brother's presence. I'm telling, listen, the, I'm still struck by the words that he used in describing you, because those are words that I would use in describing him. And to have someone like him who embodies all those things and for him to see them in you, I'm, I'm, I'm crying for you. You can be a reporter. I'll, I'll shed a tear too on your back. <laughs> it's beautiful. My brother, man, I appreciate it. Uh, again, he was, um, he was a giant. He'll be missed, but yes. uh, with his books, with his movies, you know, with the TV shows, all of that, we have a whole lot uh, uh, to share with future generations about City 48. Amen, brother. Thank you for having me, Mr. Martin. I'll talk to you soon. I appreciate it, my brother. Tell the wife I said hello. You got it. All Peace. right, man, take care. Um, Greg Carr, we're almost done with this tribute. Um, uh, we're going to chat with Reggie Hutland in, in just a moment. But I, I, I'm telling you, Greg, I, it was, and I'm a firm believer in that. It, I don't care who it is. I'm going to get to them. I'm going to say hello. I'm going to shake their hand. I, I mean, it don't matter. I, I, I hey, I mean, I, 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 there are people, I, 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 I'm, I'm in awe of them. I see them. But I never take for granted that you might be in the room with them a second time. Man, if you got that, I tell you, this is what I, in fact, in NABJ, Greg, you know, I've been, this is 1989. We were founded in December of 1975. I remember one year I got the President's Award and I stood up and I said, I said, y'all, I'm an alpha. And we have, there's never an event where we never recognize the seven jewels. I said, we should never have an event where we don't recognize the 44 founders of NABJ. Because many of them at the time were still living. And mm. we're losing them. We're losing many of our, our founders as each year go by. And so I say to everybody, when you come upon an elder. I don't care where I am. If Andrew Young is there, Reverend Jackson is there. Um, I mean, I, when, when C.T. Vivian was alive, when John, when, when John Lewis, I don't care. I never took for granted that I was in the same room with them. I always walk up to them and pay homage. You have to. And you just gave us a master class in how to do it. While everybody's standing on their feet, you make a beeline to backstage because you know he's not going to be sitting there for that whole thing. Th that's the technique, brother. That, that's, born, that's born from experience. Uh, my, my mother, uh, Fisk, gave Mr. B an honorary degree. You're now the faculty you're on. And uh, she stepped out in the middle of commencement was like, give mother a hug. Because like several generations now of black women, not just black women, but I'm thinking now about black women. Uh, Harry Belafonte and Sidney Poitier were their imaginary boyfriends in their mind. <laughs> so so there have, I, I, I'm sure there have been any number of folk who did what you did uh, to Sidney Poitier, but in, in, in to the point you're raising, you did it because you never know. You don't. Again, thinking about, I mean, we can't obviously, and, and even a, a long special, go through all his body of work, but even mentioning a piece of the action again, and that that, that trilogy, um, you know, folks, again, white stream media will mention, you know, in the heat of the night, they call me Mr. Tibbs, the organization, that trilogy, but that trilogy of Uptown Saturday Night and a piece of the action and let's do it again, it, it was Portier's comedy, but he played the straight man. Right. I mean, you know, which is hilarious—the hypnotist, all that stuff. But, 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 but the reason I'm raising that is because, it, I, and I almost forgot about this until a second ago. Remember, it was James Earl Jones mm -hmm. who 
forced Cosby and Portier to go teach those kids in a piece of action. And that made me, right. wait, Jim Jones is still here. Yes, I mean, he so like, you, you never know. In That's fact, the year. In fact, That's I've right. never, I've never been in the same room with James Earl Jones. And I, 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 I seriously, I have, I'm like, yo, I, I never got to meet Ossie Davis, never got to meet Gordon Parks, and I've always wanted to meet James Earl Jones. We, we, I've never been in the same room with him. Uh, and again, that's why, that's why I said this thoroughly. I, hey, man, I don't care. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> if I'm tell, hey, I'm telling you right now. If, if I was on the streets of D.C. Yes, sir. And James Earl Jones, and I saw he was getting in the car. We I, already know. I would stop traffic. Hell no, nah, y'all ain't moving. I'm gonna oh, shake, no I'm gonna shake your hand. I ain't, uh-uh, I, I was in the middle of, <laughs> traffic will stop. I'm gonna say hello and say, brother, thank you for all that you've done. No, no question. Hey man, I just wanna say this to you right quick, Roland, as well. Tonight, you, this is, you've added another uh, special as you pay tribute to these new ancestors. I mean, this, this is one of your fortes. And I just want to, I was listening to uh, to uh, our sister, Debbie Allen, ever the master teacher, helping those young people understand. And I just wanted to say to you that this intergenerational convening, particularly when you had Brother Whitfield and then Sterling Brown on, Sterling K. Brown, you know, it helps us understand that we have an obligation to share with young people who these folk are. And, you know, maybe those children in Debbie Allen's class today may not have heard of uh, Sidney Poitier before today, but they were impacted by him, even in ways we might not think. Remember, um, was it Let's Do It Again, where they you know, had Jimmy Walker and all them? Remember the two characters, John Amos, Brick yep. City's John Amos, yes, sir. played 40th Street Mac, and Calvin Lockhart yep. played a character named Biggie Smalls. Yep. <laughs> now, they don't, now, these young people don't even realize <laughs> That that name who came right. out of Sidney Poitier and Bill Cosby, and they, they would never associate. It. It's just man, it just. But tonight, there's no, there's nobody else that's gonna do what you did, brother. They're gonna be tributes pouring out from, and they are from everywhere. But tonight, this is black folks to the world, not just for black folk, but to the world. But it's unique, brother. And I want to thank you for doing this. Man, I appreciate it. Uh, I sat there today, um, and I watched uh, mainstream news. Uh, I looked at, yeah, packages were done. Mm -hmm. but, but truth be told, folks, truth be told, um, there's no reason in the world we didn't see wall-to-wall uh, -wall coverage. There's no reason we didn't see panels. There's no reason we didn't see um, um, uh, far more uh, than that um, because there are not many folks in Hollywood alive on the level of Sidney Poitier. And when I say not many, nobody. I'm talking about Ooh. less than on one hand. I mean, and I, I, I mean, you, you, you know, you I could, can't think anybody, bro. I mean, you can. And sh look, Gene Hackman is still out, Robert Duvall. But again, Sidney Poitier was heads and shoulders above. But but Hackman and Duvall or any of them, the, right. for example, I'll give you another example, just what we're talking about. The relation, the relationship between black women and black men. Right. In a warm December, he had the Jamaican actors. S. Anderson played a couple. For the love of Ivy, he had Abby Lincoln. They were a couple. Uptown Saturday Night, Rosalind Cash, let's do it again, Lee Chamberlain. Even the way they modeled the relationship between black women and men. No white actor in Hollywood right. did that. I, I can't think of anybody, Roland, quite frankly, who would take a seat to it. You're right. They should be, this should be wall-to-wall -wall coverage. So I want everybody to understand, when you hear uh, Greg's brother uh, Reverend Carr saying our promo, bring your eyeballs home. Yes. Tonight is the is a prime example of why Roland Martin Unfiltered was created after TV One canceled News One Now, and it's a prime reason why I created Black Star Network. Folks, there is no other place. We our tribute began two hours ago on Sydney Portier. I can't even tell y'all the people who I reached out to who couldn't come on for a variety of reasons. Run the list down, I reached out to them. And so this is why, again, what does that Freedom's Journal say? We wish to plead our own cause, too long have others spoken for us. Mainstream media has not given Sidney his just due today and tonight.
but that's why we did this. Be more next week. The others who are still reaching out, people have been outpouring on social media. But I want everybody watching to share this video because what you heard tonight from all of the folks here, the people who met them, the people who didn't meet them, was someone who is, again, Hollywood royalty, who is an icon, who is a history maker. He was an actor, he was an activist. He was a director, he was a diplomat. He was a proud black man. And so I appreciate everyone who joined us tonight to pay tribute to the life and legacy of Sidney Portiway. Uh, there will be more, uh, I didn't, didn't realize that. Uh, we got one more, I didn't realize that he was on. Actor, Mr. She. <laughs> <laughs> Isaiah Whitlock, how you doing, Doc? How you doing, man? <laughs> I'm all good. Uh, just uh, share with us. Uh, you you do take us home. Uh, share with us your thoughts uh, about the great Sidney Poitier. Uh, you know, it was it was very heartbreaking when I uh, heard that he had passed away uh, today, and um, it was very sad. A lot of a lot of emotions and things uh, uh, ran through my whole. Uh, body about when I first uh, started watching his films, inspiration he was to me as far as my career, um, watching uh, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner with my mom and a Studebaker Lark at the drive-in uh, really made me want to be uh, an actor, and uh, it, was, it was incredible. Um, the inspiration that he had for me, not just for me, but for other actors. And uh, uh, I, 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 was, I was stunned, but uh, we all gotta go, I guess. Um, absolutely true. It's a, it's a question of how we live our life. Uh, and mm -hmm. the reality is I, 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 heard a, I heard a preacher once say, um, the hardest eulogy to preach is that of an irrelevant Negro. <laughs> he said, it's hard to preach a eulogy of somebody who went through life, who left no fingerprints and left no footprints. Uh, yes. and, and, and the reality is, uh, even though uh, Sidney uh, is now an ancestor, um, he, the body of his work is mm -hmm. what will live on. So the reality is, Sidney physically is no longer here, uh, but he will always be here. Yeah, he, he will never, ever be forgotten. Uh, some of the roles and things like that were just iconic. And uh, uh, and the people that he touched, uh, and he was kind of like, he was kind of like the brown, uh, the uh, groundbreaker. I mean, uh, he was, when I remember Sidney, he was all we had. That was all we had. Uh, there was not much more. Uh, and so to see him uh, in the multitude of films that, that he was doing, uh, I mean, you had a few others, but there was no one like uh, Sidney Poitier. And um, uh, I, was, I'm, I, I just feel very blessed that I lived in a time where uh, I could see him work. I never, I never got a chance to meet him, unfortunately, but... Um, um, uh, I feel blessed. Indeed. Well, Isaiah, we appreciate your work and all that you do, and we certainly thank you for joining us to share a few words about Sidney Poitier. You bet. Thank you. It's always good to see you. Yes, my brother. Thanks a lot. Folks, uh, that is it for us. Uh, please, we want you to uh, download. In fact, um, we've crossed 25,000 downloads of the Black Star Network uh, app. We appreciate all the folks who have done so. Now we want to go after the next 25,000. Uh, and so please download the app on all available platforms, uh, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire Stick, uh, X Sony, excuse me, uh, yeah, Xbox, and also Samsung Smart TV. 
We also want you to support us in joining our Bring the Funk fan club. Your dollars make this possible for us to be able to hire the staff and the, all the folks to, to, to do this. And so uh, we talk about uh, having to put together uh, in a, a matter of a few hours a tribute like this. It is not easy, uh, but this is the business that we're in. And so you can support us via Cash App, which is R Martin Unfiltered. PayPal is uh, PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Cash App is Dollar Sign R M Unfiltered. Venmo is R M unfiltered. Zell is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. Greg Carr, always a pleasure. Uh, you uh, joining with us, uh, sharing your historical perspective. Uh, when we uh, when we lose one of our elders, when they become ancestors, uh, and folks, again, we hope you share this video, uh, spread it around. Um, people spend a whole lot of time. It's amazing when I see them sharing lots of clips of stuff they see on CNN, on MSNBC, shows that other black folks host. Uh, but share this, spread this, send folks this tribute. Uh, we'll be restreaming this all weekend as we continue uh, to show our appreciation for that great Bahamian, uh, the brother like no other, who said, call me Mr. Tibbs. Nope. In fact, we call him Sir Sidney Poitier. Folks, we pray for his family. Thanks a bunch. We'll see you on Monday. Have a good weekend.